In the realm of unsolved mysteries, the story of Teresita Bassa stands as a haunting enigma that transcends the boundaries of the ordinary. In the late 1970s, Chicago was gripped by a murder case that defied explanation, until an extraordinary turn of events brought an otherworldly element into the investigation. Imagine a scenario where the victim's own ghost serves as the guiding force, leading detectives down a path they could never have anticipated. Well, that's exactly what happened. Teresita Bassa's ghost, through the possession of a woman named Remy Chua, became an unexpected ally in solving her own murder, providing chilling insights from beyond the grave, and leading to the arrest and imprisonment of her own murderer. This chilling tale not only challenges our understanding of crime and justice, but delves into the eerie intersection of the supernatural and the tangible, making it a case that continues to intrigue and mystify. Join us as we unravel the inexplicable events surrounding the Teresita Bassa case, where the boundaries between the living and the dead blur in the pursuit of truth. From beyond the grave, the ghost that solved a murder, the victim. In the 1960s, Teresita Bassa ventured from the Philippines to the United States with dreams of studying music. However, her interests evolved, leading her to delve into the complexities of the human body. Settling in her new homeland, she secured a position as a respiratory therapist at Edgewater Hospital, located near Chicago. Amidst her demanding job, Bassa continued her scholarly pursuits, aiming for a master's degree in music. Colleagues and friends fondly characterized her as a brilliant yet reserved individual, embracing a laid-back lifestyle. Beyond her professional endeavors, she dedicated her time to teaching local children the art of piano playing. On a typical day, February 21, 1977, Bassa followed her routine, working at the hospital until 5.30 p.m. Little did anyone know that tragedy loomed. Around three hours after her departure, neighbors caught a whiff of smoke permeating the air, its origin shrouded in mystery. Emergency services rushed to the scene, discovering the source in Bassa's apartment. A fire had been ignited, seemingly masking a more sinister truth. Amidst the charred remnants, Bassa's lifeless body was found, her demise cleverly concealed by the flames marking the beginning of a perplexing investigation. The investigation. Upon entering Teresita Bassa's apartment, firefighters made a grim discovery. Her lifeless naked body hidden beneath a mattress. Shockingly, she bore multiple stab wounds with a knife cruelly embedded in her chest. Swiftly, authorities were summoned to the scene, where they deduced that the assailant had orchestrated a fire, possibly to erase any potential clues left behind. Despite initial suspicions of sexual assault due to her unclothed state, the autopsy results contradicted this theory. The ferocity of the blaze consumed most items in the apartment, leaving investigators with scant evidence to unravel the mystery. Curiously, Bassa seemed to lead a tranquil life, devoid of known adversaries or high-risk activities. A phone conversation with her friend, Ruth Loeb, offered a mere glimpse into the final moments before tragedy struck. Their chat abruptly ended as Bassa hinted at an impending visitor, although she never revealed the person's identity. The only other clue left behind was a cryptic note that read, Get theater tickets for AS, leaving investigators grasping at straws in their quest for answers. Despite tireless efforts by investigators, the perplexing case seemed unsolvable. The friends of the 48-year-old woman remained clueless about who could harbor ill intentions against her. Even her neighbors could offer no insights into any unusual activities on that ominous night. By April 1977, the investigative trail led to a dead end, and the mystery of Teresita Bassa's demise grew colder. However, in a surprising turn of events in August, Joseph Stachula, the detective assigned to Bassa's case, received a tip from police in the suburb of Evanston. The information concerned a man named Alan Showery, a fellow employee at Edgewater Hospital, the same workplace as the victim. What made this lead intriguing was the matching AS initials found in the note discovered at Bassa's apartment. How the Evanston police learned about Showery remained a puzzle, prompting Stachula to contact Dr. Jose Chua, the source of this unusual tip. And where Dr. Chua got the information was about to shock and confuse everyone involved in the case. The Ghost Dr. Chua, along with his wife, Remy, had immigrated to the U.S. from the Philippines and resided in Evanston. Initially hesitant to divulge their story, fearing disbelief from authorities, they eventually opened up to Stachula. Driven by a sense of urgency, Dr. Chua recounted a strange incident. His wife, Remy, had abruptly risen from their living room and wandered into their bedroom in a trance-like state. Alarmed, Dr. Chua followed her and found her reclined on the bed, speaking in a different voice, using their native language, Tagalog. When he inquired about her identity, she responded, Ako Teresita Basa, meaning I am Teresita Basa. This revelation added an eerie layer to an already baffling case. Dr. Jose Chua found himself immersed in a surreal and eerie encounter within the confines of his own home. Unaware of the murder of Teresita Basa, 
he engaged in a conversation with his wife, Remy, who appeared oddly different. In an inexplicable twist, Remy identified herself as Teresita Bassa, revealing a chilling account of her own demise. According to her, a man named Alan Showery, whom she considered a friend, had entered her apartment. Tragically, their friendship was a guise. Showery had stabbed her, ending her life in a brutal act of violence. This bizarre revelation stunned Dr. Chua, leaving him perplexed. After this trance-like episode, Remy returned to her usual self, and they grappled with the surreal nature of the encounter. Remy confessed to having met Basa once during a hospital orientation, yet they never formed a close bond due to their differing work hours. Fearful of ridicule and disbelief, the couple opted to keep this inexplicable incident to themselves, unwilling to share their extraordinary experience. However, Basa's persistent spirit did not relent. In a subsequent encounter, she implored Dr. Chua for assistance through his wife once more. During this interaction, she revealed crucial information. The investigators needed evidence to convict her murderer. Basa's ghost disclosed that Showery had stolen a distinctive pearl ring from her, a detail previously unknown to the authorities. This revelation shook Dr. Chua to the core. Basa's spectral visits persisted, prompting the couple to make a momentous decision. Convinced of the urgency and authenticity of Basa's messages, they resolved to share their extraordinary account with the police, hoping it would provide a vital lead in the pursuit of justice. The Killer According to Dr. Chua, while under Basa's alleged possession, Remy divulged a harrowing tale. She claimed that Alan Showery, who had come to repair her television, had ruthlessly stabbed her and pilfered her jewelry. Detectives Joseph Stachula and Lee Eplin took the Chua's claim seriously, especially considering Showery's initials matched those found in Basa's diary. Yet this inexplicable connection seemed to hold more enigma than any rational explanation could provide. Detective Stachula, no stranger to the gritty underbelly of Belmont, was used to dealing with pimps, prostitutes, and drug dealers. But the involvement of Dr. and Mrs. Chua marked a remarkable departure from his usual routine. The Chua's, an educated and sophisticated couple residing in a substantial and expensive home, presented a stark contrast to his usual sources of information. With no other leads to go on, Statula attentively listened to the strange claims and decided to investigate them. Armed with this unbelievable tip, Statula confronted Alan Showery. Initially, Showery denied any involvement in her tragic demise, only admitting to knowing her. However, his narrative soon wavered. Showery, employed as a respiratory technician at the same hospital where both Chua and Basa worked as respiratory therapists, had experienced a precarious financial situation. In a symbiotic relationship, Basa had generously provided financial assistance to Showery in exchange for his occasional handyman services. Eventually, his story morphed into a tale of a repair visit he paid to Basa's apartment on the fateful night, attempting to fix her television, just as the ghost had told the Chua's. During their investigation, detectives observed a striking piece of evidence. A ring worn by Showery's pregnant partner, Yanka Kamluk, closely resembled the stolen pearl jewelry described by Dr. Chua. Upon questioning, Kamluk asserted that Showery had gifted her the ring, a claim seemingly debunked by Basa's family, confirming its authenticity as the victim's missing item. As the evidence stacked against him, Showery succumbed to the weight of guilt, confessing to his heinous deeds. His initial intent had been robbery, but the situation spiraled out of control, leading him to commit the appalling act. To conceal his crime, he staged a gruesome scene, stripping Basa's body and setting her apartment ablaze, attempting to obliterate any trace of his misdeeds. The Trial Yet this twisted narrative took a further turn as Showery later withdrew his confession. He alleged that the police had resorted to threats of arresting the expectant Kalmuk unless he confessed. His lawyer, William Swano, mounted a vigorous defense, contending that the murder charge should be dismissed. Swano underscored that Showery's arrest hinged solely on the Chua's bewildering account, boldly stating, Never to my knowledge has a man been arrested because of a supernatural vision. Police have never before been informed of a criminal's name by a voice from the grave. Nevertheless, the judge ultimately decreed that the trial should proceed, plunging the case into an even deeper enigma. It's not as if we plan to interrogate a disembodied voice or delve into supernatural realms, clarified a spokesperson from the prosecutor's office to the Washington Post. We're not particularly intrigued by the supernatural aspect of this trial. While the voice served as the initial lead, the evidence we have was independently developed. The trial became a sensational spectacle, splashed across headlines such as, Did a voice from the grave finger a murder suspect? However, the courtroom drama concluded in a mistrial as the jury remained deadlocked, unable to reach a unanimous decision. In an unexpected turn of events, just as preparations for a new trial were underway, Showery abruptly changed his plea to guilty. 
He was subsequently sentenced to 14 years for charges including murder, robbery, and arson, but the intriguing question lingered. Had a voice from the afterlife truly influenced a conviction, or was there a more ordinary explanation at play? The connection between Remy Chua and Showery in their workplace, Edgewater Hospital, raised speculation. Some suggested that Chua might have stumbled upon damning information about Showery during their professional interactions. Additionally, rumors circulated that Remy harbored resentment towards Showery, purportedly due to complaints she'd made about the quality of his work. Yet amidst these conjectures, the true nature of the eerie events remained shrouded in mystery. During the court proceedings, Showery's legal team attempted to paint Remy as the actual perpetrator, suggesting she had sold the jewelry to Showery, hence explaining its presence with Kalmuk. They contended that Remy concocted the entire possession story after losing her job at the hospital. However, Remy was never seriously considered a suspect in the investigation, despite her exceptional knowledge of the murder, supposedly sourced from beyond the grave. The Aftermath In the aftermath of the trial, the Chuas authored a book titled A Voice from the Grave, alongside their friend Carol Mercado. Reflecting on the case, Dr. Chua remarked, All of us want to believe in life after death. After that, the Chua's lives had gradually returned to normalcy in the years following the murder and trial. Leading a quiet life, Remy never experienced any supernatural events again. In a surprising turn, Showery was released from jail in 1983, merely six years after Bassa's tragic demise. He also retreated into a life of obscurity, seeking solace in the tranquility of anonymity. The case of Teresita Bassa stands as a remarkable blend of the mysterious and the mundane, intertwining the supernatural with the very real world of crime investigation. Through the curious medium of possession, Dr. Jose Chua and his wife Remy provided investigators with a lead that cracked open the case, resulting in the apprehension of Alan Showery, the man responsible for Bassa's brutal murder. While skeptics may question the supernatural aspect, the facts of the case cannot be ignored. Bassa's jewelry, her possessions, and the initials noted in her diary all converged to implicate Showery, lending credibility to the information channeled through Mrs. Chua. Despite the inexplicable nature of the initial tip, Statula, the seasoned investigator, affirmed that while he wasn't convinced exactly how the information was received by Remy, he was convinced of its authenticity based on the evidence later uncovered. In the courtroom, amidst sensational headlines and public intrigue, Showery's conviction, albeit after a mistrial, brought a semblance of justice. However, questions linger about the motivations and circumstances surrounding Bassa's tragic end. The Teresita Bassa case remains an enigmatic chapter in the annals of true crime, challenging our understanding of justice, the afterlife, and the unexplained. Though the legal proceedings have ended, the echoes of this extraordinary case continue to resonate, leaving us with an enduring sense of fascination and wonder. Did Bassa's own ghost really solve her murder? Is there more to this case that is yet to be revealed? Could Showery have somehow been framed? Or could Remy have discovered information about the heinous crime some other way? But if that was the case, why did she concoct such an elaborate story that would shed doubt on her information? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and subscribe as it really helps the channel to grow. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In 1803, a man in Hammersmith, London shot a ghost. Well, more accurately, he tried to. Obviously, it didn't actually work. What actually happened was that he shot a bricklayer wearing all white, mistaking him for a specter that had been terrorizing the local neighborhood. Swiftly arrested, the man was put before a jury, who were given only two options for his fate. Guilty or not guilty. With no other choice, they rendered a guilty verdict, sentencing him to dissection and death. In a desperate attempt to escape this horrific fate, the man reached out to the king who, surprisingly sympathized with his attempt to gun down a poltergeist and commuted his sentence to a year of hard labor instead. Even more shockingly, the outcome of this trial took over 180 years to reach a full resolution in the British courts, impacting the legal system to this very day. So let's take a proper look at what happened in this strange case that altered British history as we explored the time that a man shot a ghost. Sort of, anyway. The Hammersmith Ghost Murder Case Rarely do legal history and tales of the supernatural intertwine, but such an unusual convergence is exactly what happened in the Hammersmith Ghost Incident of 1804, a chilling episode etched into the annals of British crime history. In the midst of the shadowy tenements of 19th century London, a wave of fear swept across Hammersmith as rumors of a malevolent spirit took hold of the community. 
As terror metamorphosed into hysteria, an innocent man fell victim to a tragic case of mistaken identity, leaving the British courts facing a perplexing dilemma. Could a man be deemed guilty of attempting to harm a ghost? Ghostly goings-on. In the waning months of 1803, residents of Hammersmith, West London began having encounters with, and even being attacked by, a spectral presence. This ghostly apparition was rumored to be the spirit of a man who had taken his own life the previous year and found his final resting place in Hammersmith's churchyard. During this era, prevailing beliefs held that suicide victims, deemed to have committed a mortal sin, were consigned to damnation. Their bodies were denied burial in consecrated ground, as it was thought to disturb the repose of their souls. Consequently, the local populace harbored the conviction that they were haunted due to the improper burial of the suicide victim. Accounts of the ghost's appearance varied among witnesses. Some described a towering figure clad in white robes, while others insisted it wore attire made of calfskin, featuring horns and large glass-like eyes. In an era steeped in superstition, a chilling ghost story swiftly permeated the collective consciousness, triggering a surge in paranoia as accounts of the entity's attack circulated. Thomas Groom, a servant, recounted his eerie encounter with the spectral entity. I was going through the churchyard between 8 and 9 o'clock, with my jacket under my arm and my hands in my pocket when some person came from behind a tombstone, which there are four square in the yard behind me, and caught me fast by the throat with both hands and held me fast. My fellow servant who was going on before, hearing me scuffling, asked what was the matter. Then, whatever it was, gave me a twist round and I saw nothing. I gave a bit of a push out with my fist and felt something soft, like a great coat. Panic swept through Hammersmith, a typical reaction to such occurrences, as rumors intertwined and took on a life of their own, especially after an alarming tale emerged, asserting that a pregnant woman had died of fright after being assaulted by the ghost. The last reported ghost sighting before tragedy unfolded transpired on December 29, 1803, when night watchman William Girdler glimpsed the apparition along Beaver Lane. In a pursuit, the ghost cunningly discarded its white shroud, vanishing from sight. This event spurred some citizens to organize armed patrols in a bid to apprehend the elusive specter. Yes, you did hear that right. Armed citizens really did go on the hunt for a ghost. Tragedy unfolds. Regrettably, the mounting hysteria culminated in a fateful encounter on January 3rd, 1804. Girdler crossed paths with an armed citizen, none other than 29-year-old excise officer and aspiring ghost hunter Francis Smith who brandished a shotgun in his quest to confront the ghost. The two agreed to rendezvous at 11 p.m. under Girdler's watch, in an attempt to apprehend the elusive apparition together. Shortly past 11 p.m., Smith encountered Thomas Millwood, a bricklayer making his way home after visiting his parents and sister. Millwood, wearing all white garments including impeccably washed linen trousers, a seemingly new and very white flannel waistcoat, and a wrapped apron, became the unfortunate protagonist in the unfolding tragedy. According to Anne Millwood, Thomas's sister and a witness to the encounter, Smith, in a fit of aggression, exclaimed, Damn you! Who are you and what are you? Damn you, I'll shoot you! Before fatally shooting Millwood in the head, the sound of gunfire summoned concerned neighbors who rushed to the scene, discovering a distraught Smith standing over the lifeless body. After what must have been a moment of triumph, Smith confronted the harsh reality that he had in fact committed a grave error. Advising him to depart, the crowd insisted he return home. However, before he could comply, a constable arrived and promptly arrested him. Millwood was rushed to the nearby Black Lion Inn, but alas, it was already too late. A surgeon named Mr. Flower conducted a post-mortem examination. Mr. Flower's findings revealed that the cause of death was a projectile from the shotgun that had penetrated the vertebrae of his neck, causing damage to the spinal marrow. As a result, Smith found himself ensnared in the precarious predicament. He had believed he had been firing his weapon at a ghost, yet he had just murdered an innocent man instead. The trial. Smith found himself on trial for willful murder at the Old Bailey later that year, and it didn't take long for the proceedings to take a dire turn for him. The trial commenced with the poignant testimony of Millwood's grieving widow, who recounted warning her husband not to wear his all-white work clothes at night. Having previously been mistaken for a ghost, her concern for his safety was, as it turned out, entirely reasonable. Damning evidence came from Millwood's sister, who vividly recalled Smith's abrupt firing having given her brother no time to stop after being demanded to by Smith. The jury grappled with an intriguing question. Could claiming to perceive someone as a supernatural being serve as a defense against murder? Chief Judge Lord Baron Sir Archibald MacDonald then reminded the jury that premeditation wasn't a prerequisite for a guilty verdict, only the intent to kill. The judge underscored that Millwood had never posed a threat to Smith and was denied the opportunity to provoke him. Furthermore, Smith, 
rather than attempting to apprehend the supposed ghost, chose to shoot on sight. Consequently, the judge asserted that the killing couldn't be justified as an act of self-defense or an accidental shooting. Millwood's defense presented declarations of Smith's good character, but the judge dismissed them. He emphatically conveyed to the jury that character had no bearing on the case. Smith had unequivocally shot Millwood. The judge stressed that Millwood had committed no wrongdoing, and even if he had been feigning being a ghost, it would only constitute a minor misdemeanor, not something warranting a fatal shooting. Legal proceedings and a shift in perspective. After deliberating for an hour, the jury rendered a manslaughter verdict. The judge, instructing them that their only options were murder or acquittal, told them to go back and come to a new conclusion. Upon their return, the jury delivered a guilty verdict, leading to Smith's initial sentencing of hanging and dissection. However, after a plea to the king who surprisingly sympathized with his situation, this severe sentence was commuted to a year of hard labor instead. The crux of the case revolved around whether Smith could be held accountable for his actions, even if they stemmed from the mistaken belief that Millwood was a ghost. The judge at the time argued that Smith couldn't plead self-defense because he had never been in any real danger. Despite his error, Smith had taken a life and according to the prevailing legal stance, had to face the consequences. However, this verdict faced scrutiny, including from the king, leading to the commutation of Smith's original sentence. The question of fairness in not considering Smith's serious mistake lingered. So much so, that it took another 180 years for the English legal system to address this issue. The resolution came in the early 1980s during a different case. A man, believing he witnessed one person assaulting another, intervened and attacked the alleged assailant. However, it turned out that the supposed assailant was apprehending the other person on suspicion of theft, not attacking him. The intervening person was convicted of assault but appealed, asserting that he genuinely believed the victim was the perpetrator, even if that belief was mistaken. The judges, after careful consideration, concurred with this argument and overturned the conviction. Lord Chief Justice Lane, presiding over the appeal, acknowledged the historical nature of the debate, stating that the case raised legal issues that had been under discussion for an extensive period. He proceeded to provide clarification on the matter. In a case of self-defense where self-defense or the prevention of crime is concerned, if the jury came to the conclusion that the defendant believed, or may have believed, that he was being attacked or that a crime was being committed, and that force was necessary to protect himself or to prevent the crime, then the prosecution have not proved their case. If, however, the defendant's alleged belief was mistaken, and if the mistake was an unreasonable one, that may be a peaceful reason for coming to the conclusion that the belief was not honestly held and should be rejected. Even if the jury comes to the conclusion that the mistake was an unreasonable one, if the defendant may genuinely have been laboring under it, he is entitled to rely upon it. As a result of the appeal, the conviction was quashed, and this decision gained approval from the Privy Council in Beckford v. The Queen, 1988. Subsequently, it was formally incorporated into British law through the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008, Section 76. Conclusion Contemplating whether Smith would have escaped culpability for Millwood's killing if tried 180 years later remains a matter of conjecture. Smith actively sought out trouble that fateful night, and trouble indeed found him. Regardless of Smith's potential mistake, the undeniable tragedy lies in the loss of an innocent life due to a hasty trigger finger. The United Kingdom enforces stringent regulations on the use of force in self-defense, making it dubious that a contemporary jury would deem shooting a ghost in the head with a shotgun as reasonable force. However, a lingering question persists. Who or what was the Hammersmith ghost? Well, it wasn't solely a creation of the vivid imaginations of Londoners. A few days after the tragic demise of Thomas Millwood, a cobbler named John Graham sheepishly stepped forward, owning up to being the ghost. He disclosed that the apprentices in his workshop had been regaling his children with frightening tales. Seeking retaliation, he devised a plan to scare the apprentices by donning a white tablecloth and making nocturnal appearances. The heightened fear among Londoners did the rest. The narrative of the Hammersmith ghost serves as a striking illustration of mass hysteria. Residents in the vicinity genuinely succumbed to escalating rumors, and their paranoia culminated in a tragic fatality. Regrettably, the people of Hammersmith didn't entirely learn the lessons from the events of 1804. Two decades later, reports of sightings of the Hammersmith ghost resurfaced. This time, however, it was claimed the ghost could even breathe fire. Meanwhile, the saga of the Hammersmith ghost, along with the tragic case of Millwood and Smith, found a place of remembrance on a plaque outside the Black Lion pub, where it stands today. And with that, this strange true story comes to a close. As always, thanks so much for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the channel and drop a comment down below. I've just set up a membership option for the channel you can join if you want to. I don't make any money from these videos yet, so any support is truly appreciated. There are a few perks available right now, such as early access to my upcoming videos, and I'll be trying to add more benefits as the channel continues to grow. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. As household objects began to shift and relocate within the Bowen family's residence, Frank Bowen initially dismissed his daughter's unease. He attributed their concerns to an overactive imagination, possibly fueled by unresolved issues linked to their mother's death. But his daughters were convinced that something real was happening. Was this proof that their house was haunted by an evil spirit of some sort? Or was it a sign of a truth that would turn out to be far more chilling? On December the 8th, 1986, the reality of their tranquil lives was shattered when Frank Bowen and his daughters discovered the truth behind these apparent supernatural happenings as they were confronted with the jarring revelation that a real, disturbing presence had been clandestinely living within their home all along. It was this unsettling experience that forced Frank Bowen to grapple with the horrifying truth he had long disregarded. Unbeknownst to them, someone had been living in their house, Daniel LaPlante, and when Daniel would finally make his presence known to them, a horrifying ordeal was about to unfold. But what the Bowen family experienced was merely a taste of the disturbing and brutal crimes Daniel would proceed to commit. While the Bowens may have escaped with their lives, Daniel's next victims, the pregnant Priscilla Gustafson and her two children, seven-year-old Abigail and five-year-old William, would not be so lucky. The killer who lived in the walls, Daniel LaPlante, Delving into the life of Daniel LaPlante reveals a tapestry of complexities and unsettling experiences. Hailing from Townsend, Massachusetts, Daniel spent his early years under the roof of his mother and stepfather. However, behind closed doors, he faced a harrowing reality that would shape his trajectory. Daniel's childhood was marred by a disturbing history of physical and psychological abuse, inflicted by various adults including his own father and stepfather, as well as an unexpected source, his psychiatrist. This tragic pattern of abuse would cast a long shadow over his life, influencing his psyche and future actions. Struggling academically, Daniel grappled with a diagnosis of dyslexia, a learning difficulty that added another layer of challenge to his educational journey. As he navigated school, his classmates' perceptions painted him as an outsider, many describing him as creepy and weird, further isolating him from the social fabric of his youth and it wasn't long before he began to show signs of antisocial behavior and extreme violent tendencies. As he ventured into his teenage years, Daniel's illicit activities became increasingly alarming, marked by a series of arrests for breaking into his neighbors' homes. He brazenly pilfered jewelry, cash, and other valuables, swiftly cultivating a reputation that cast him in a decidedly unfavorable light within the community. The Bowen Home the Bowen household had been grappling with unsettling and confusing occurrences such as objects being moved and television channels being switched. These small but noticeable events had been occurring for several weeks, leading daughters Tina and Karen to suspect their house was being haunted. Before long, these small issues began to escalate. Soon they found leftover milk and food would be consumed when they left the room, and even furniture would be rearranged. But things took a sinister turn when the daughters found messages written in blood on the basement wall. Their father, Frank Bowen, dismissed their claims, instead believing that his daughters were behind the actions and that it was all some sort of coping mechanism linked to the recent loss of their mother. But Frank's concept of reality took a chilling turn when his daughters discovered another message written in blood on their bedroom wall. Inspecting the house, Frank discovered that an unknown presence had used their toilet. Now convinced his daughter's claims were real, Frank was about to realize the horrifying truth. There wasn't just an intruder lurking within the walls of their home, but an intruder who had been living there for nearly a year. Wasting no time, Frank began scouring every inch of the house. Though still not quite convinced of what was going on, he was determined to find out the truth. To his shock, he stumbled across Daniel LaPlante hiding in a closet, adorned in a bizarre ensemble of a furry jacket and strange face paint. Daniel emerged with a hatchet and a steel wrench and forced Frank and his family into a nearby room. To Tina's surprise, she recognized Daniel. Disturbingly, she had once very briefly dated him. Able to slip past their captor, Tina valiantly seized an opportunity and clambered out of a window, sprinting over to a neighbor's house to get help. 
When the police arrived at the scene, Daniel had already vanished without a trace. Despite a thorough search of the house, the police were unable to locate any sign of his presence. Shaken to their core, the Bowens refused to return to their home, instead staying at a nearby hotel for the night. The next day, Frank returned to the house to retrieve belongings from the residence. As he approached the front door, he looked up to see a shadowed figure watching him from the window above. Frank immediately contacted the police, and when Officer Stephen Besenson arrived at the scene, he was greeted by a chilling tableau. A knife thrust into the wall through a family picture bearing the ominous message, I'm still here, come find me, accompanied by another image pierced by another knife with the words, I'm going to kill you all. Joined by Chief David Young and Sergeant Jim Scott, a meticulous search of the house ensued. But once again they found no sign of an intruder. That is, until one of the officers identified a wall concealing pipes in the bathroom that was big enough for somebody to hide within. Inspecting it he spotted a pile of clothes that was concealing the intruder. Drawing their guns, the officers demanded that the figure come out with his hands up. Finally, Daniel emerged from his hiding place, but he seemed to show no fear of their guns, resulting in a tense standoff. Eventually, they were able to restrain Daniel and take him to custody, incarcerating him in a juvenile facility where he stayed until October of 1987. After remortgaging her house, Daniel's mother raised the $10,000 bail needed for him to be released. Little did she, the police, or the Bowens realize how lucky of an escape the family had had. Daniel's actions had been disturbing and threatening, but they were nothing compared to what was about to happen. The gruesome Gustafson murders. Despite only just being released on bail, 17-year-old Daniel instantly began breaking into an array of houses, stealing items and causing trouble. One of these houses belonged to a young couple, Andrew and Priscilla Gustafson, and their two young daughters. For some reason, Daniel chose to return to the Gustafson household, orchestrating a nightmarish intrusion into the residence. On December 1st, Priscilla picked up her young son, William, from his babysitter and returned to her home where, unbeknownst to her, Daniel was waiting. The stage had been set for a brutal tragedy that would forever scar the town's history. Typically, Daniel would flee a house when its occupants returned, but driven by malevolent intent, on this macabre occasion, he made the decision to remain in the home. Daniel seized Priscilla, who was several months pregnant, and bound her to her bed before imprisoning young William in a closet. The events that then transpired are beyond the realm of comprehension and too disturbing to go into details. Daniel tormented and assaulted the pregnant Priscilla, leading to her death as he shot her twice using a gun he had stolen from one of her neighbor's homes. But Daniel's sickening acts did not stop there. He turned his attention to the young children in the house. William met his end in the upstairs bathtub, his innocence betrayed by the chilling darkness that engulfed him. As Daniel went to leave, he crossed paths with Abigail, Priscilla's seven-year-old daughter, as she returned from school. Like her brother and mother, Abigail met her end at the hands of the twisted and disturbed home invader. The evening took a harrowing turn as Priscilla's husband Andrew arrived home from work. What he encountered was a scene of incomprehensible horror, a room stained with Priscilla's blood, the life he knew irrevocably shattered. Andrew was too afraid to go and look for his children, scared of finding them dead too. All he could do was scream in agony and despair. The tragic events that unfolded on that grim day are forever etched into the town's collective memory as a chilling testament to the depths of human malevolence. The hunt for Daniel LaPlante. The moment the gruesome murders came to light, authorities swiftly zeroed in on Daniel LaPlante as a potential perpetrator, announcing his name in a press conference as a suspect. A local resident, Lynn McGovern, called the police when she had returned home, only to instantly retreat from her garage when an overwhelming sense of discomfort took over her. Whatever it was that she had noticed and had triggered her response, she had been right. When a policeman arrived to escort her into her house, they made a startling discovery. Upon entering the home, they encountered Daniel, who swiftly leapt out of a window and vanished into the encompassing woods, evading capture. Later that evening, on the very same street he grew up, Daniel re-emerged and coerced resident Pam Makila into her car. A struggle ensued, resulting in Makayla leaping out of the vehicle and escaping, though unfortunately it also meant Daniel could slip away once again. But as dusk settled over the town, the relentless efforts of law enforcement bore fruit as police officers managed to locate Daniel hiding in a trash can in the nearby town of Ayers and apprehend him. In the aftermath of the horrors that had unfolded, Frank Bowen expressed anger and frustration at the decision to release Daniel initially. If he had been kept in custody, the Gustafson family would still be alive, having been living in fear ever since Daniel had been released after invading his home and threatening to kill his family. Seeing what Daniel had gone on to do, Frank told a local newspaper, if Daniel LaPlante does not get convicted and gets out again, 
I will personally kill him. What happened next? After his trial in 1988, Daniel LaPlante was found guilty of all three counts of murder in connection with the tragic Gustafson family slayings. The verdict resulted in a life sentence confining him to the walls of the Massachusetts Correctional Institution, Norfolk, where he remains incarcerated. In 2017, an opportunity arose for Daniel to seek potential release under a Massachusetts law that granted a chance at reintegration into society for juveniles sentenced to life imprisonment. During his resentencing, Daniel seized the occasion to extend an apology for his heinous actions and to plead for a second chance at redemption. Daniel acknowledged the irrevocable damage he had wrought, acknowledging, Words cannot fully capture what I have done. I murdered three innocent people. Because of me, a five-year-old boy will never turn six. There's a seven-year-old girl that will never turn eight. Because of me, a woman will never be able to give birth to her third child. I robbed an unborn child of his first breath. A husband was never able again to hear from his family, I love you. I do not have the words to fully express my profound sorrow, but I am truly sorry for the harm I have caused. From the very essence of who I am, from the depth of my soul, I am sorry. Whether this plea was done out of true remorse or in attempt for freedom, nobody will ever truly know. Despite Daniel's efforts at reconciliation, a psychiatric assessment depicted a disconcerting lack of empathy coupled with a tendency to downplay the gravity of his behavior. Priscilla's sister stood firm in her belief that her sister would never have wanted Daniel to regain freedom. Further insight emerged from Carol Gustafson, Andrew Gustafson's second wife, who revealed that Andrew was tormented by nightmares of his family's murder until his unfortunate death from cancer in 2014. Her impassioned plea echoed through the corridors of justice. Do not let this man out. He should rot in prison. In response, the judiciary delivered a sentence of 45 years in prison. In 2019, a new law emerged, allowing juveniles convicted of murder the opportunity to petition for parole after serving a minimum of 30 years. While this law presented a glimmer of hope for Daniel that he may be released, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court upheld the initial judge's decision, preserving the course of justice. The disturbing and haunting story of Daniel LaPlante unveils the complexities of the human psyche and the dark potential that resides within. Daniel's life and crimes serve as a chilling reminder of the depths to which a person can descend when consumed by a toxic combination of mental instability and malevolence. While Daniel's history of abuse certainly shines some light on his mental state and reveals the path that led to him becoming the monster he became, it does not excuse it in any way. However, as a society, we need to find ways to identify and prevent other children going through the experiences Daniel did and find ways to help nurture and heal damaged individuals so they do not grow up to become the living embodiments of the horrors they bore witness to in their youth. Daniel's actions were extremely disturbing, and the justice system has to hold some responsibility for allowing him to leave on bail and commit his horrific murders when he was clearly a dangerous, mentally unstable and volatile individual. Daniel's case goes to show some real-life horrors are worse than anything that could be fictionalized. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below, and for more dark stories and mysteries, make sure to subscribe. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. Throughout European history, genuine tales of monsters are surprisingly commonplace. For centuries, Christians were firmly convinced that entities like witches, ghosts, demons, and vampires weren't just fantastical fictions, but were real creatures actively engaging in lethal and disturbing acts. And there is no more quintessential an example of this than the story of Peter Stump. In 1920, Montague Summers, an English clergyman and author, rediscovered a long-forgotten pamphlet in the British Museum that provided intricate insights into Stump's life, including his crimes and the subsequent trial after his capture. Almost all of our knowledge about this event is derived from these 16 pages. The original broadsheet, published in German, underwent an English translation, and only two copies exist today, one in the British Museum and another in the Lambeth Library, both located in London. No copies of the original German pamphlet have ever been found. After offering guidance to werewolf hunters on how to effectively dispose of a captured beast, the pamphlet delineates the gruesome deeds of Peter Stump, a wealthy German farmer. On the fittingly ominous day of October 31st, 1589, a sizable assembly congregated in the German town of Bedburg, situated near Cologne, to bear witness to a gruesome execution. The condemned individual, Peter Stump, had openly admitted to entering into a diabolical pact with the devil. But his aspirations weren't for wealth. 
Rather, he coveted the ability to transform into a werewolf. His shocking litany of crimes spanning 25 years encompassed multiple murders and acts of cannibalism, including the butchering of pregnant women and multiple children, one even being his own son whose brain he had consumed. Described as a hellhound unlike any other by the local authorities, Stump even confessed to engaging in incestuous relations with his daughter as well as sleeping with a succubus demon gifted to him by the devil himself. However, upon closer examination through a rational lens, Stump's story perhaps takes on a different, yet no less monstrous dimension. Especially as his confession coerced through horrifying torture which paved the way for one of the most brutal executions in European history, leaves lingering doubts as to whether he actually had any involvement in any of the murders he was accused of. As history intertwines with folklore, the unsettling question arises, was Stump truly guilty of the crimes he faced, let alone being a werewolf? Or was he a victim of a far more sinister plot, the Werewolf of Bedburg, the disturbing true story of Peter Stump? Peter Stump's early life remains shrouded in mystery, leaving historians perplexed. Born around 1530 in the village of Eprath near Bedburg, Germany, his name might not have even been Stump at all. Alternately referred to as Abel Griswold, the moniker Stump could have originated from the fact that his left hand was amputated, leaving only a stump. Regarding his adult life, it's believed that he was a prosperous farmer, a widower, and a father to two children. A daughter named Beale, and a son whose name has been lost to history. Character-wise, up until his exposure as a werewolf, he seemed to be well-liked. The English pamphlet described him as such. He would go through the streets of Cologne, Bedburg, and Eprath, in comely habit, and very civilly as one well known to all the inhabitants thereabout. And oftentimes was he saluted of those whose friends and children he had butchered, though nothing suspected for the same, the scarcity of concrete information regarding Stump's life. Assuming that was indeed his name, presents a significant challenge. Compounding the issue, church records from the relevant period were lost during the ravages of the Thirty Years' War. No surviving interrogation transcripts or court records exist. So to delve into Stump's particulars, historians have had to rely on a compilation of pamphlets and handbills. The most extensive among them is the English pamphlet published in 1590, purporting to be a translation of a German work, although the original document has yet to be located by historians. But these posthumous accounts of his life are also suspect, tainted by falsehoods, inaccuracies, or excessive sensationalism due to the widespread notoriety of his case. What follows is, as far as reports at the time were concerned, a true account, those of a sensitive disposition might want to click off the video now, however, as the story I am about to tell you is a particularly nasty one. The Wolf In the historic town of Bedburg, Germany, a series of gruesome incidents involving cattle mutilations and monstrous killings marked by torn open abdomens unfolded between the years 1564 and 1589. Initially attributed to wolves by local villagers, the situation soon took a darker turn. Before long, women and children started vanishing, only to have their mutilated corpses discovered days later. The superstitious townsfolk swiftly attributed these events to unnatural forces at play. Fear permeated the community, restricting people to their homes and compelling them to venture out only in armed patrols. Those daring to travel between towns reported stumbling upon abandoned, dismembered limbs of victims in fields. The mere disappearance of a child prompted parents to assume the worst, attributing it to the relentless wolf preying on another victim. For a quarter century, the onslaught persisted, claiming the lives of numerous men, women, children, cattle, and sheep devoured by the malevolent creature. Over time, a pervasive belief took hold, solidifying the conviction that a monstrous entity was responsible for the disappearances. Whispers of a werewolf initially originated from the harrowing experience of a local girl who, in the face of danger, invoked divine intervention and was rescued by a stampede of cattle. Within this chaotic scene, villagers encountered a wolf, severing its left forepaw with a sword. Then, in 1589, an extraordinary incident unfolded. Children at play in a meadow witnessed the sudden emergence of a wolf from the woods, seizing a young girl by the collar of her coat. Thankfully, the wolf's attempt to attack was thwarted as the stiff collar prevented its teeth from piercing through. The terrified children raised the alarm, compelling the creature to abandon its prey and flee. Pursuing villagers soon had the creature cornered, but as they closed in for the kill, the wolf vanished, and in its stead stood Peter Stump. Whether the transformation was witnessed, or if Stump coincidentally found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time remains unclear. Observing that Stump was missing his left hand, just like the wolf that was previously fought off and believed to be the demonic creature, the villagers had no doubt that Stump and the wolf were one and the same entity. Outside of his missing hand and alleged appearance at the scene, 
Stump's culpability rests entirely on his subsequent confessions, extracted through the use of torture and the looming threat of further torment. Thus being apprehended, he was shortly after put to the rack. But fearing the torture, he voluntarily confessed his whole life. The Confession Stump confessed to having practiced black magic since the age of 12, claiming that the devil had rewarded him with a magical belt or girdle. This enchanted accessory allowed him to transform into the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large which in the night sparkled like fire, a mouth great and wide with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. Stump asserted that removing the belt reversed the transformation. When questioned about the belt's whereabouts by a local magistrate, he claimed to have left it in a certain valley. Despite sending a bailiff to retrieve the belt, it was never found. Surprisingly, the absence of the belt and inconsistencies in Stump's story did not raise concerns with his accusers. Under the threat of more torture, Stump confessed to being an insatiable bloodsucker, admitting to the gruesome killings of at least 14 children and two pregnant women, among numerous others, over a 25-year period. His descriptions of the pregnant women's fate were particularly distressing, detailing the ripping of fetuses from their wombs before eating their hearts panting hot and raw, which he later described as dainty morsels. Stump even shockingly admitted to the heinous act of murdering his own son, whom he had deceitfully lured into the forest. Using the enchanted girdle, he transformed into a wolf and proceeded to cruelly slew him and eat the brains out of his head to staunch his greedy appetite. This revelation carried particular significance because the untimely demise of his son had initially shielded Stump from suspicion. On top of murdering his own son as a monstrous serial killing wolf, Stump also confessed to having an incestuous relationship with his 15-year-old daughter, as well as a distant relative called Catherine, that he claimed to be his mistress. In addition, Stump even admitted to sharing his bed with a succubus that was sent to him as a gift by the devil himself. The Execution Stump's trial unfolded as one of the most horrific acts of punishment in European history. Initially fastened to a wheel, his body endured the excruciating ordeal of having the flesh torn from it in ten different places, a gruesome act executed with red-hot pincers. The same merciless procedure was then extended to his arms and legs. Proceeding with the grim spectacle, the executioner wielded the blunt side of an axe, systematically breaking all of Stump's flayed limbs. This brutal act aimed to ensure he couldn't crawl out of his own grave and continue to wreak havoc. The grotesque spectacle culminated with his beheading, followed by his body being burnt on a pyre. Catherine and Beale faced a similarly harrowing fate having endured being flayed, strangled, and burned alongside Stump's body. As a precautionary measure against potential wolfish behavior, a torture wheel was erected on a pole featuring the figure of a wolf and crowned by Peter Stump's severed head. Contextualizing wolves and witches, the sensational nature of Stump's transgressions and the ensuing punishment captivated the collective imagination. Despite the prominence of Stump's trial and execution, it was not an isolated occurrence. Between the 15th and 18th centuries in Europe, the convergence of famine, plague, war, and religious turmoil fostered superstitious beliefs. These encompassed apprehensions regarding witches, predominantly women, and werewolves, predominantly men. While accusations of lycanthropy occasionally overlapped with, but were considerably less frequent than witchcraft, some European regions lack any recorded instances of werewolf trials. In England, where wolves were nearly eradicated in the 16th century, historical records contain no accounts of werewolf trials. Similarly, the Mediterranean region of Europe has no documented cases. European werewolf panics were concentrated in areas inhabited by wild wolves, wooded regions, and communities with a strong tradition of livestock herding, as observed in Germany and France. Apprehensions initially rooted in concerns about actual wolves preying on animals and children gradually morphed into fears of demonic wolves. In cases where rabid wolves were present, werewolves might be scapegoated for the perceived crimes. The most comprehensive catalogue of werewolf trials in early modern Germany comprises approximately 300 cases. While a substantial number, it pales in comparison to the staggering 30,000 to 45,000 executions for witchcraft recorded in Germany during the same period. Charged individuals accused of being werewolves were predominantly male, with a majority being shepherds. According to Brian Levac, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Texas at Austin, wolves were viewed as strong, violent, and aggressive, traits usually associated with men. In most accounts pertaining to Stump, the man purportedly transformed into a wolf through the use of a wolfskin belt bestowed upon him by the devil. By removing this belt, Stump could revert to his human form. Levac highlights that all werewolves utilize some form of instrument for their transformation, aligning with the characteristics of male witchcraft. He notes, 
All of them use some sort of instrument in their magic, such as Stump's use of a magical belt, whereas the lower forms of village magic allegedly practiced by female witches consisted mainly of charms, curses, or various concoctions, theories, and speculations. The motivations behind Bedberg's conviction of Stump as a werewolf remain shrouded in mystery. Some historians posit he might have been a murderer, perhaps even a cannibal with crimes so gruesome that people could only rationalize them with supernatural explanations. It's entirely possible that werewolf legends in general originated as explanations for the presence of historic serial killers. Whether or not Stump was actually a killer, it is probable that any local wolf attacks on livestock or people were unjustly attributed to him. Rumors surrounding Stump, his daughter and his mistress likely fueled the fervor, accusing a widower entangled in familial relations whose son vanished under dubious circumstances seemed fitting for a community seeking a monstrous scapegoat, possibly tinged with envy due to his wealth. Alternatively, Stump's innocence remains a possibility, casting him as a victim and a scapegoat. The timing of his trial during the Cologne War, a clash between Protestants and Catholics, definitely raises suspicions. The region was plagued by marauding mercenaries during this period, and unsolved crimes could have fueled ominous folktales of a werewolf haunting the forests. Consequently, Stump might have been singled out as a ritualistic means to purge the community of perceived evil through his execution. Furthermore, there is a strange detail that appears incongruent with historical facts, hinting at an underlying layer beneath the surface story of Peter Stump the werewolf. Both the 16-page pamphlet and the German broadsheets emphasize the presence of members of the aristocracy at Stump's execution, including the new archbishop and elector of Cologne. This singular fact implies the existence of a concealed motive. Relevance may be found in the block of years during which Stump was purported to have committed his crimes, which coincided with a period of internal spiritual and political turmoil. The electorate of Cologne experienced upheaval with the introduction of Protestantism by the former Archbishop Gebhard Truxess von Waldberg. Stump, an early convert to Protestantism, participated in a war that historians contend unleashed unbridled violence among soldiers on both sides, leading to a plague epidemic. In 1587, the Protestants suffered their final defeat, and the new Lord of Bedburg, Werner, Count of Salm Reiferscheid Dyke, transformed Bedburg Castle into the headquarters for his Catholic mercenaries, resolute in re-establishing the Roman faith. The werewolf trial of Stump may have served as more than a persuasive tool, albeit not gently, to encourage the remaining Protestants to convert to Catholicism. It seems improbable that Germany's elite would attend a conventional werewolf or witch trial, which were, in fact, commonplace. Instead, it is likely that, having outlined Stump's alleged and truly outrageous crimes, the elite orchestrated a grand public spectacle. With ensured visibility to the general public, the nobility embarked on their rides to witness the disembodiment of a werewolf, a Protestant rogue, an embodiment of anti-Catholic spiritual darkness. One might argue that no public relations stunt since has equaled the uniqueness and sheer morbidity of the execution of Peter Stump. Conclusion In the twilight realms where history meets myth, the tale of Peter Stump, the Bedberg werewolf, remains a haunting enigma. As we peel back the layers of time, the shadows of uncertainty persist, leaving us to ponder the true nature of this 16th century figure. Stump's life, mired in accusations of unspeakable crimes and dark pacts, becomes a canvas reflecting the fears and anxieties of a society grappling with the unknown. The execution of Stump, marked by its brutality, stands as a testament to an era marred by religious strife, political tensions, and an insidious intertwining of folklore with the judicial system. Was he a predator, a victim, or merely a pawn in a larger, more sinister game? The intricate dance between historical records and the spectral whispers of the past makes it challenging to discern truth from embellishment. As we navigate through the foggy corridors of the Cologne War and the werewolf trials that marked the 17th century, the resonance of Stump's story with the broader context of witch hunts becomes apparent. The line between reality and myth blurs, reminding us of the fragility of historical narratives and the human inclination to craft tales that mirror our deepest fears. The Bedberg werewolf, like other figures in the cryptic gallery of history, beckons us to question, to reflect, and to acknowledge the complexity of the human experience. Whether Peter Stump was a genuine menace or a casualty of his times, his story lingers as a cautionary reminder of the ever-shifting interplay between truth and legend. As we close the chapter on this enigmatic narrative, the shadows persist inviting us to peer into the darkness and contemplate the enduring mysteries of our shared past. As always, thanks so much for watching, and please like and subscribe and comment down below if you enjoyed this video. It really does help the video to gain traction and the channel to grow. I'm interested to know what you all think about this video, as it's a blend between my usual true crime stories, the supernatural, and the weird and dark side of history. 
If you like it, I'll try and cover more cases like this in the future. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In the tranquil village of Goas Aludu, nestled in the picturesque region of Brittany, northwest France, a chilling mystery unfolded in April 1922. Two-year-old Pauline Picard, an innocent toddler, disappeared mysteriously while playing on her family's farm, casting a dark shadow over the serene countryside. Fortunately, she was discovered several weeks later in a town over 400 kilometers away from where she vanished. Yet this only deepened the mystery. How had she traveled so far from her home? Had she been snatched away, or was there a more perplexing explanation? After returning home with her relieved parents, it wouldn't be long before a grisly discovery would undermine everything they thought they knew. And with this discovery came a haunting question. Was the girl who had returned home with them really their daughter, or was it an entirely different child? And if it wasn't their daughter, then who actually was this mysterious girl? Join us as we delve into this sinister and perplexing case that has echoes of folklore stories of changelings and fairies, but sadly lives in the realms of a much, much darker reality. The Real Life Changeling, The Shocking Case of Pauline Picard Chapter 1, The Disappearance In the serene countryside of Goas al Ludu, where the rolling hills of Brittany, France, painted a picturesque backdrop, young Pauline Picard spent her days frolicking with her sisters on the family farm. The farmstead, a tranquil haven nestled east of Brest, was the cherished abode of a diligent farmer, Francois Picard, his devoted wife, and their nine children. The farm, usually a haven of peace, echoed with the laughter and playful shouts of the Picard children. Playing outdoors was a common sight, and Pauline, a curious two-year-old, often joined her siblings in their adventures. Under the vast skies of April 1922, as the fragrant aroma of spring hung in the air, a routine evening turned into a heart-wrenching mystery. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a warm golden glow over the farm, Mrs. Picard called her daughters inside for dinner. The usual joyful chatter of her children returning filled the air, but there was an unsettling absence. Pauline was nowhere to be found. The worry etched on her mother's face reflected the sudden, inexplicable disappearance of the youngest Picard, casting a shadow over the once tranquil farmhouse. In a unified effort, the Picard family, local law enforcement, and the entire community mobilized to search for little Pauline, affectionately dubbed La Petite Pauline Picard by the media. The day of her disappearance saw an army of more than 150 people meticulously combing through the Picard family farm, as well as the dense woods and vast countryside that surrounded the area, desperately searching for any trace of the missing child. Despite their collective determination, she had simply vanished, leaving behind an eerie void where her laughter once echoed. Her family, gripped by fear and confusion, speculated that she might have wandered off, falling victim to the cold or becoming prey to a wild boar. However, the absence of her body baffled everyone deepening the sense of mystery that shrouded her disappearance. Rumors and whispers swept through the village, weaving a web of uncertainty. Some spoke of a chimney sweep who allegedly lured Pauline with candy, while others mentioned the presence of two strangers lurking around the farm during her disappearance. Gypsy abduction was another theory circulating, although no concrete evidence of their presence in the neighborhood at the time could be found. In the ensuing weeks, gendarmes and police inspectors tirelessly scoured the countryside, hoping to unearth a clue that would lead them to Pauline. Despite their relentless efforts, the little girl had seemingly vanished into thin air, leaving behind a community haunted by unanswered questions. Weeks elapsed, each day dimming the flickering hope of finding Pauline alive. But then, something miraculous happened that nobody could have predicted. Chapter 2. The Girl from Far Away In an unexpected turn of events, police in the bustling city of Cherbourg, nestled in the heart of Normandy, stumbled upon a bewildered child matching Pauline's description. This mystery girl was found abandoned in the hallway of a local home on Rue Coipel, left to wander alone in a city far from her home. A poorly clothed woman had been seen with her a few days prior, attempting to abandon her in a store but ultimately being thwarted by vigilant bystanders. The authorities were called, and the girl was taken to a hospice where her presence sparked curiosity and concern. When a police officer presented a photograph of the child to Pauline's mother, a torrent of emotions flooded her. Joy, relief, and gratitude overwhelmed her heart. Her daughter had been found. Fueled by newfound hope, the Picard family embarked on the 400-kilometer journey north to bring their precious daughter back home. However, amid the initial wave of relief, an unsettling doubt began to creep into their minds. Casting a shadow over what should have been a moment of unbridled happiness, 
the lingering uncertainty gnawed at their hearts. Was this truly Pauline, their long-lost daughter? Upon their arrival at the hospice in Cherbourg, the Picards were met with a disconcerting sight. The girl bore a striking resemblance to Pauline but was noticeably thinner, a consequence the police surmised of the weeks spent missing. She appeared cared for, her clothing, though different from what she had worn on the day she disappeared, was well maintained. Strangely, despite her seemingly healthy appearance, the child remained eerily silent upon reuniting with her family. A profound silence settled over her, devoid of the happiness one might expect from a child reunited with her parents. As her parents attempted to communicate with her, a disconcerting truth emerged. She did not comprehend their words. The language of her homeland, Breton, spoken throughout Brittany, fell on deaf ears, leaving her family puzzled and heartbroken. The inexplicable circumstances surrounding Pauline's return raised a multitude of perplexing questions. How had she traveled a staggering 400 kilometers? What had befallen her during her absence? The unsettling enigma deepened as she exhibited no recollection of her family, her memory seemingly wiped clean. Amnesia, a result of post-traumatic stress, was offered as a tentative explanation for her lack of recognition and understanding of her mother tongue. Despite initial doubts, the Picards gradually became convinced that the girl was indeed Pauline after spending several days with her. With hope in their hearts, they took the girl back to Goas al Ludu, anticipating that her familiar surroundings might trigger her memory and bring back her voice. During the journey home, the girl uttered three words in Breton on the train, a glimmer of hope that she might recover her lost identity. Upon returning to the family farm in Goas al Ludu, the siblings recognized her, yet a shadow of uncertainty lingered within the household. The girl's request for bread and her calls to the family cat in the local language added to the perplexing enigma, leaving the Picard family and the entire village in a state of puzzling bewilderment. Then a visit from a neighbor named Eves Martin shattered the fragile peace that had settled over the Picard household. What seemed like a celebration of Pauline's return took a chilling turn when Martin, upon seeing the child, let out a bone-chilling scream. God help me, I am guilty, he cried out before fleeing, leaving the family and the entire neighborhood in a state of shock. His actions would later lead to his admission to an asylum, adding another layer of mystery to the already bewildering tale of Pauline Picard's disappearance and return. Chapter 3. The Disturbing Truth Amidst the quietude of the morning on May 26th, a passing farmer near the Picard household made a gruesome discovery that shook the village to its core. He had found the badly mutilated and decomposed body of a small girl. She lay naked her head brutally severed, the remains horrifyingly ravaged by the passage of time. Beside the lifeless form lay a meticulously folded pile of clothes, a chilling juxtaposition of care and brutality. The eerie arrangement of the clothing, placed and not scattered, suggested a deliberate act. Shaken to the core, the farmer hastened back to the village where he sought help from the gendarmes, the local police. The village inhabitants, including the Picard family, gathered at the scene, their hearts heavy with dread. The clothes, unmistakably the ones Pauline was wearing on the day she vanished, confirmed their worst fears, amplifying the sense of tragedy that hung in the air. Despite their grief, they faced a chilling reality. The body was so severely decomposed that identification proved impossible, especially as the head found separate from the body had been devoured by scavenging foxes. Strangely, the gruesome scene lay within an area that had been meticulously combed multiple times during the initial search operation. The grim news reverberated far beyond the confines of the small village, reaching even the pages of the New York Times. The newspaper reported on the meticulous search conducted during Pauline's disappearance, emphasizing that the body would have been discovered had it lain where it was found. This led to a haunting conclusion. The body and the neatly arranged clothes had been placed there recently, raising questions about the unknown perpetrator's motives. The absence of the head, hands, and feet, juxtaposed with the presence of a nearby severed head, added an even more macabre layer to the mystery. The once peaceful village was now gripped by fear and confusion, as the unsettling truth remained just out of reach, buried beneath layers of uncertainty and speculation. A detailed medical examination of the remains only deepened the enigma. The severed head, initially assumed to be that of a child, was revealed to belong to an adult male, introducing the sinister notion of a second victim, a mysterious adult whose identity remained elusive. Curiously, Pauline's torso and stomach Typically, the first targets for scavengers remained intact. The medical examiners, despite their expertise, found themselves baffled. Cut marks and bites on the bones hinted at scavenger activity, but the cause of death remained elusive. Was it possible that Pauline had succumbed to the elements after becoming lost, or had a more sinister plot unfolded? Initially, her parents questioned if someone had abducted Pauline, lost her, 
and then orchestrated the placement of a deceased body bearing a haunting resemblance to the missing girl. They did, after all, have the real Pauline back at home with them. At least, that's what they thought. But then, the official report concluded that the body was indeed Pauline, her tragic demise attributed to accidental circumstances. According to the inquiry, she had become lost, stranded in a storm that ravaged the area that fateful night, with scavengers causing the gruesome injuries post-mortem. However, those who had tirelessly searched for her contested this explanation, vehemently claiming that they would never have missed her body during their exhaustive search. Despite the inquiry's findings, the mystery persisted, compounded by the unanswered question of the adult skull's origin. Pauline's grieving parents laid her to rest beneath a headstone bearing her name, offering a somber farewell to their beloved daughter. Chapter 4 The Changeling In the wake of the grim discovery of the body now confirmed to belong to Pauline, a perplexing question loomed large. Who was the girl from Cherbourg, the child that the Picards had been caring for with such tenderness and hope? The end of May 1922 brought a surprising twist as authorities located the woman who had been witnessed attempting to abandon a girl in Cherbourg. To their astonishment, it was revealed that she had her own daughter by her side, dispelling the notion that she was connected to the mysterious girl they had taken in. Speculations arose, suggesting that the girl's parents might have emigrated to America, leaving her fate hanging in the balance. By mid-June, the Picard family made the heart-wrenching decision to send the girl back for adoption in Cherbourg, a bittersweet resolution to a deeply troubling chapter. Back in Cherbourg, the foundling girl captured hearts and headlines alike. Her swift mastery of complete sentences in the Breton language earned her the moniker, the girl with the pretty smile. Some newspapers even speculated that this child was the real Pauline Picard, given there was no real way to identify the mutilated corpse at the time. The tale of the Cherbourgeoise girl, bathed in curiosity and adorned with a captivating smile, attracted the gaze of hopeful families yearning for adoption. She was christened Marie-Louise Pauline by the civil court of Cherbourg and entrusted into the care of the Franciscan sisters of Notre Dame de Vaux. But alas, her story too was destined for a tragic end. The cruel hands of a measles epidemic claimed her life on a wintry January day in 1924, leaving behind a legacy of unanswered questions and echoing whispers in the corridors of time. 98 years later, the enigma of what transpired that fateful day, as well as the identity of the unknown child and adult, remain shrouded in darkness. Without the aid of DNA evidence, the secrets of Pauline Picard and the mysterious second child have endured as one of the greatest mysteries of the past century. Chapter 5. The Suspects The aftermath of Pauline's discovery prompted intense scrutiny. The field where her body was found had been meticulously searched during the initial investigation, leading authorities to entertain the chilling possibility that she had been placed there days after her disappearance. The meticulously folded clothes strategically positioned hinted at sinister intentions, raising unsettling questions about foul play. The unsettling mystery deepened with the discovery of the second victim's skull found near Pauline's remains, adding a layer of complexity to the already confounding case. During the early stages of the investigation, suspicion fell upon a man named Caraman, an umbrella salesman who had worked as a farmhand for the Picards. He had been present at the Picard household on the day of Pauline's disappearance, displaying peculiar behavior that raised eyebrows. Caraman's inappropriate interactions with Pauline, being seen to cuddle her frequently when he had been welcomed to the family breakfast table that morning, coupled with his ominous remarks about finding her a new home, raised red flags. Despite being left alone with Pauline at one point where he was overheard telling her she would be going with him, his alibi and the timing of events cleared him of direct involvement. He was briefly detained for unrelated fraud charges but was eventually released, his connection to the disappearance proving to be inconclusive. Another figure emerged in the form of Eves Martin, a middle-aged farmer who visited the Picard family. After the chilling moment in which he appeared to confess after encountering the changeling at the farm before anybody knew Pauline was dead, Martin was reported to have gone into a manic state and was quickly locked up in a psychiatric hospital. His sudden descent into madness cast a shadow of suspicion, leading investigators to consider the possibility that he might have been involved in Pauline's tragic fate. Yet, even in death, whispers of Pauline's continued existence echoed through the narrow lanes of Brittany. Rumors like tendrils of fog slithered through the air, weaving a chilling tale of her abduction by a wealthy family. According to these murmurs, they had replaced Pauline with their own ill-fated child, leaving the world to mourn a life that still breathed. The pages of Le Petit Parisien, capturing the essence of these sinister murmurs, predicted a resurgence of the investigation, a quest for truth that lingered in the air like an unanswered question. But if their speculation held any truth, 
it has not come to light in the countless years since this theory was first published. The case of Pauline Picard remains shrouded in uncertainty, a complex web of clues and contradictions. The village of Goa Saludu and the surrounding countryside echoes with unanswered questions, leaving both the authorities and the community grappling with an enigma that forever altered their lives. Conclusion As we close the chapter on the perplexing case of Pauline Picard, a chilling shroud of mystery continues to enshroud her story. Despite the passage of time, the questions surrounding her disappearance, the discovery of her purported remains, and the unsettling speculations persist like ghostly whispers in the night. Even in the face of exhaustive investigations and countless theories, the truth remains elusive, leaving us with a profound sense of unease. The disappearance of this innocent toddler has transcended generations, captivating the minds of those drawn to unsolved enigmas and sparking the imagination of writers and artists alike. In the absence of definitive answers, Pauline Picard's legacy endures as a reminder of the enigmatic nature of life's darkest mysteries. Her name lingers in the echoes of history, inviting new generations to ponder the chilling unknowns that still haunt the quiet corners of Brittany, France. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed hearing about this strange true crime case. While very dark and disturbing, the mysteries and unanswered questions behind this one really captivated me, especially as it genuinely does have echoes of folklore stories about changelings, even if the truth is likely something much more unsettling than any myth or story. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and drop a comment down below as it really helps my channel to grow. Feel free to let me know about any cases you would like me to explore next. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In the dimly lit streets of Barrio Rivadavia, near the Buenos Aires Cemetery of Bajo Flores, a chilling encounter unfolded on Sunday, April 11, 2010. Rodrigo Escura, a 27-year-old philosophy student, found himself in a harrowing situation, confronted by a group of young people led by Marcelo Alejandro Antelo, known as Marcelito. Escura, his new bicycle, wallet, and phone already taken from him, pleaded, I'm not going to give it to you, you'll kill me first. But Antelo, unyielding, retorted, you ask me, son of a bitch, before firing a fatal shot into Escura's chest with a 9mm gun. Escura's desperate venture through the dark streets hinted at a deeper struggle, one driven by insatiable cravings. Little is known about the depths of his desperation, but it led him to a fatal encounter in the hallways of the Rivadavia 2 buildings. Cornered, he surrendered his belongings without resistance, but resisted when Antello demanded the drugs he had just purchased. Despite his compliance, it seemed Escura's fate was sealed. Unbeknownst to Escura, his tragic demise marked the beginning of a horrifying spree orchestrated by Antelo. This murder was merely the first in a series of heinous acts, between four and six, with additional failed attempts, perpetrated by Antelo over the next five months. Shockingly, these crimes were carried out as part of what investigators referred to as a pact with San La Muerte, the saint of death. Antelo had made a sinister promise to the saint, one death a week in exchange for protection for himself and his family, ensuring a constant supply of drugs. This dark covenant set off a wave of violence, leaving a trail of victims and terror in its wake. The San La Muerte Killer, a pact with death. Chapter 1, A Spree of Violence Before the brutal murder of Escura, Marcelo Antello's criminal history had been relatively minor, devoid of any significant violent incidents. His upbringing was marked by a tumultuous family life, characterized by his grandmother's alcoholism, his father's addiction issues, and his mother's tendency to resort to violence. In early 2010, at the age of 22, Antelo, also known as Marcelito, had a brush with the law when he was pulled over by a patrol car from the 38th police station while driving alone in a stolen car. Although initially charged, he was ultimately released. Digging into his records, the criminal recidivism registry revealed a prior incident from February 2009 where he was declared in absentia by a court in Lomas de Zamora for failing to appear as a witness in a robbery case. These incidents constituted the extent of his criminal history until he embarked on his disturbing spree of violence. At the time of Escura's murder, Antelo resided in a house marked with number 1018 in the Rivadavia neighborhood, cohabiting with a group of fellow addicts known locally as the Kindergartners. Living under the same roof as Jorge Mancilla, the owner of the house, Antelo's relationship with Mancilla soured, leading to his eviction. In the wake of this, he vowed revenge. True to his word, Antelo wasted no time in seeking vengeance. On the night of June 24th, 
he ambushed Dario Romero, another former housemate, shooting him in the hand with a shotgun. Despite Romero's writhing pain, Antello refrained from delivering a fatal blow, instead reveling in his cruel act. Antello's thirst for revenge escalated further on August 2nd when he targeted Mansilla's residence. He called out Mansilla's name, demanding his presence, and when met with silence, he fired at the house. Six days later in the early hours of August 8th, he returned to the scene. This time, without uttering a word, he rang the doorbell. When Mansilla opened the door, he was met with Antelo's cold stare. It was the last sight Mansilla beheld before Antelo ruthlessly ended his life, shooting him in the head with a 9mm pistol. Chapter 2 The Fortunate Escape of a Mechanic A few hours after the chilling murder of Mansilla, Marcelito remained at large in the neighborhood, fueled by a thirst for vengeance. His target this time was the mechanic Mario Chiero, who, in reality, owed nothing to Antelo, but rather to one of his acquaintances, who he owed 300 pesos for a car repair job that had never been completed. For context, that's around $15. Yet for a bloodthirsty figure like Marcelito, such details were inconsequential. Antelo confronted Chiero at his workshop, situated in a garage beneath the mechanic's residence, demanding the money. When Chiero refused, Antelo, without uttering a word, retrieved a 9mm pistol from his clothing and attempted to pull the trigger. One, two, three times he tried, but the pistol jammed, failing to fire. Taken aback, Marcelo inspected the gun, managed to unlock it, and fired a shot into the air to confirm it was working. However, this delay allowed Chiero to retreat upstairs and barricade himself inside his home. Instead of retreating, Marcelito began firing at the front of the house, all while bystanders remained passive, failing to intervene or alert the authorities. Eventually, Chiero's wife, from a window, negotiated with Antello. She offered him 150 pesos, all the money they had, in exchange for him leaving them in peace. Reluctantly, Antello accepted the offer. However, as the woman descended to hand him the money, he issued a chilling threat. If I ever see your husband again, I'll kill him, he warned before casually walking away, blending into the neighborhood as if he hadn't just terrorized an innocent family. Chapter 3 More Tragedy and the Pursuit of Justice The final two murders orchestrated by Marcelo Antello echoed the brutality of his initial crime where Rodrigo Escura fell victim. On the night of August 15th, Marcelo Cabrera, 28, and Pablo Zaniuk, 26, like Escura before them, navigated the dim passageways of Barrio Rivadavia in search of drugs. In a chilling repeat of his modus operandi, Marcelito and an unidentified accomplice intercepted them in a corridor near house number 107, close to Korea Street. Threatened at gunpoint, both young men relinquished their belongings, but tragically, it did not spare their lives, Zaniuk met his end with a fatal shot to the face, while Cabrera suffered nine gunshot wounds to various parts of his body. At this point, law enforcement was actively pursuing Antello, eventually leading to his capture 13 days later. On the morning of Saturday, August 28th, officers from police station 38 spotted him on the corner of Esteban Bonarino and Oceania in the Rivadavia neighborhood. When ordered to stop, Marcelito responded with gunfire, but thankfully the police managed to subdue him. Upon his arrest, it was discovered that Antelo was carrying a 9mm pistol accompanied by two fully loaded magazines, bearing an intact serial number and a federal police shield. Further investigations confirmed that this weapon had been stolen from an officer on March 26th, just a few months prior. Moreover, ballistic tests revealed that this pistol was the same one used in the fatal shootings of Escura, Mansilla, Cabrera, and Zaniuk. According to the case investigators, Antelo could potentially be linked to two additional murders in Bajo Flores between April and August 2010. However, conclusive evidence to support these claims remained elusive. Chapter 4. A Pact with Death The true nature of Marcelo Antelo's sinister spree began to unravel after his arrest, hinting at a connection with a pledge he had made to San La Muerte, a saint not recognized by the Catholic Church in exchange for protection. Close relatives of Antello disclosed to investigators that he was a devoted follower of this obscure saint and that he had entered into a dark covenant, promising one life a week in return for San La Muerte's sheltering embrace. A witness revealed a chilling detail. Marcelito had allegedly recorded himself with Escura's pilfered cell phone, articulating his vow to kill a person every week as part of his pact. Strangely, this phone never surfaced, leaving behind a mysterious void. Following Antello's apprehension, Journalists delving into the heart of the Rivadavia neighborhood were met with an impenetrable wall of silence. Amidst this silence, journalist Liliana Caruso managed to extract a crucial testimony, shedding light on the unsettling promise. A relative of Antelo, who chose to identify himself as Jorge to avoid repercussions, cautiously revealed, Some things that are said are true, others are not. 
I didn't see him very often due to my work commitments. What I can affirm is that the young man initially embraced evangelism and everything seemed fine. However, at some point he became entangled with a sect worshipping San La Muerte. That's when he started uttering strange things, engaging in peculiar activities. He vanished from here and was never seen again. San La Muerte, commonly known as the Saint of the Good Death, exists on the fringes of religious recognition tolerated by the Catholic Church. This religious figure finds a fervent following in the Argentine Mesopotamia, the province of Buenos Aires, and select provinces in the northern regions of the country. The supposed devotion of Marcelo Antello to this saint, coupled with his vow to commit murder in exchange for the saint's protection, may appear to be rooted in the cult of San La Muerte. However, the true essence of this cult diverges significantly from the perception that Antello's actions might suggest. Despite its intimidating name and image, San La Muerte is merely one among several revered figures in a popular saint's pantheon, which includes Gauchito Gil, Defunta Correa, and even contemporary icons like Gilda and Potro Rodrigo. These figures coexist alongside more traditional religious entities such as the Blessed Seferino Namuncura and various incarnations of the Virgin Mary, explains anthropologist Alejandro Frigerio, a researcher at Conicet. San La Muerte, positioned at the less orthodox end of this spectrum, is perceived as a potent spiritual entity capable of aiding troubled devotees. Those who practice this devotion, increasingly prevalent across the country, do not venerate death as an antithesis to life. Instead, they anthropomorphize it, endowing it with human qualities, portraying it as the most just of the saints, the one who ultimately embraces everyone, regardless of their wealth or poverty. Nevertheless, certain prayers to this saint can lead to misinterpretations and subsequent misguided actions. One such prayer reads something like this, though keep in mind I had to use Google Translate to turn it into English so it may be slightly inaccurate. Saint Death, spirit skeletal and strong, beyond measure, your majesty like Samson, indispensable in moments of danger, I invoke you. Certain of your benevolence, I pray to Almighty God, grant me all I seek from you. Let remorse grip the one who harmed or cursed me. May they face your wrath instantly. For those who deceive me in love, I beseech you to bring them back to me. And if they disregard your mysterious command, mighty spirit of death, let them feel the might of your scythe. In games and business, I appoint you my best counsel, and to all who stand against me, may they forever meet defeat. O oh, Saint Death, my guardian angel. Amen. Chapter 5. Condemned. In the wake of his capture, a lengthy legal battle culminated in Marcelo Antello receiving a life sentence on September 14, 2012, handed down by the Oral Criminal Court No. 27 of the Federal Capitol. The sentence held him accountable for the heinous murders of four individuals, Rodrigo Escura, Jorge Mancilla, Federico Zaniuk, and Marcelo Federico Cabrera. Additionally, Antello was convicted for causing injuries to three others, Jorge Diaz Armas, Jorge Quiero, and Dario Romero. Throughout the proceedings, Marcelito maintained a bowed head, seemingly engrossed in silent prayer, refusing to exercise his right to address the court. His defense in a bid to overturn the verdict, lodged an appeal challenging the constitutionality of the life imprisonment sentence. In a pivotal ruling in June 2014, Chamber 3 of the Federal Chamber of Criminal Cassation dismissed the defense's appeal and upheld the original sentence. Regarding the claim of unconstitutionality, the judges asserted that the sentence imposed on Antelo does not exceed the bounds of proportionality considering the enormity of the injustice and the degree of culpability exhibited by the accused individual. Conclusion In the chilling saga of the San La Muerte killer, Marcelo Antello's gruesome crimes and the terrifying promises he made to the obscure saint have left an indelible mark on the annals of criminal history. Through a series of heartless acts, he shattered the lives of innocent victims and plunged an entire community into fear and despair. The relentless pursuit of justice, however, prevailed, leading to Antello's conviction and life imprisonment for his heinous deeds. This harrowing tale serves as a stark reminder of the dark corners of belief and devotion where individuals can be driven to unimaginable lengths by their warped convictions. In the aftermath of this disturbing chapter, the affected community remains scarred but resilient, determined to heal and rebuild, united in their shared determination to ensure that such horrors never recur. The actions of the San La Muerte serial killer were extremely brutal and disturbing, but whether Marcelito really had made any sort of pact with the Saint of Death, as claimed by his family and the police, is ultimately unclear especially given most of his crimes appear, at least to me, to be focused exclusively around drug addiction and revenge, rather than anything particularly occult or ritualistic. What do you think of this haunting case? Would you like to see me cover more obscure international crimes and serial killers such as this Argentinian story? If so, let me know down in the comment section below.
As always, thanks so much for watching, and please like and subscribe, as it really does help the channel to grow. I appreciate all of your support so far and hope we can continue to build a great community of mystery and true crime enthusiasts. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.